choose like a S&P um, 500? For everyone, this is the S&P 500 index uh, ETF exchange traded fund. So um, basically, this is a fund that holds the components of the S&P 500 index. And the S&P 500 is probably the most important index in the US market. And it holds um, market cap weighted uh, uh, stocks. So the highest or the company with the highest market capitalization gets the largest weighting. And then, you know, less market capitalization gets less weighting until we get to 500 stocks. And that's what the index contains. Yeah. So that's what we're trading now. <laughs> The S&P, S&P 500 ETF, the SPY, is actually the index divided by 10. <laughs> um, mm. The reason for that is often the way they do this is because it's, that it's more affordable for, you know, people that don't have so much money. So if you buy, if you have to buy one stock for 3,800, let's say, that's a lot of money for a lot of people. And so if you split it by 10, it makes it more accessible to people and... <laughs> So often that's done. That's that's why it's a factor of ten lower um, <clears throat> than the index. So so basically tracks more or less the index, <laughs> but at a lower price. And then I was thinking of shorting, right? Because when there's okay. an up market, you know, like a bull market, it's it's always mm -hmm. nice. But when there's a bear market, a down market, it's yeah. it's also pretty interesting to to actually like you know check if you can make profits on that one. For those who don't know shorting. Basically, what you do is you borrow a stock from your broker and then you sell it on. And so let's say you borrow it for $100 and then you sell it on for $100. You bag the money, you get $100 into your account and then you expect the stock to drop. And so if the price of the stock drops to say $90, you buy it back for $90 and you give it back to your broker and you essentially make $10. Or you keep ten ten dollars. You obviously have to buy it back for ninety, but uh, which is not quite a hundred. Um, now, one of the issues with shorting is, and I don't know if you're aware of this, uh, Josh. Mm -hmm. You know, when you buy a stock, right, and it you lose money, you can lose a hundred percent of your money, right? If it mm -hmm. if you buy it for hundred, when it goes to zero, you lost a hundred percent. Now, if you short a stock at a hundred. And it goes to 300, you're basically losing way more than that. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So you're actually losing $200. Um, so one of the issues with shorting is this is really important to understand that you can actually lose more than the stock is worth. You can lose effectively an infinite amount. If you know, if the stock that you shorted goes to the moon, you know, your losses could theoretically be infinite mm -hmm. so shorting is a very dangerous game <laughs> mm, okay just, just uh <laughs> side note here that's that's good to know <laughs> mm. okay um, so so what we're seeing here yeah. is basically that little uh trading algo that we built last time where we entered at a certain price and then exited So you've got the long and the short. Now, what's the problem here? You see, the issue is when you build trading algos, you constantly have to ask yourself, am I making a mistake? What is wrong here? Uh, this is not because uh, uh, you're overcritical with yourself, but if you mess it up, you can lose a lot of money. <laughs> so you should be critical. <laughs> so this is never about being wrong. This is always about avoiding pitfalls. Okay. So... What is the trap in what you just built and what I built for that matter as well before? See this threshold 380, yeah? Mm -hmm. how, how did you come up with that number? You came <laughs> up with that number because you looked at you looked at the previous data, right? So what you do is you look at the previous data and then you, you basically build a trading algorithm. You could choose, you know, initially you chose the number 3,800, yeah? What's and, and you didn't get any trades for obvious reasons, but what what does it? Why 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 should you not choose three thousand eight hundred? Why should you use three hundred? Choose three hundred eighty. The reason why you chose it is because you've already seen 
effectively the future data. Yeah, you've seen the whole curve from back then until now, and then you run a back test. And that's what's called data snooping or look ahead bias. <laughs> you've already, you, you know, when you built the strategy, you already had a knowledge that the price would go to 380 and from there probably down. Yeah. So, so basically what you're doing is when you build this algorithm, you're kidding yourself of building something that makes money. But, but the only reason why it does make money is because you have already seen uh, the, the curve, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and so, so what I'm trying to say here is it's actually very, very easy to miss those little issues and to fall into traps like that. It's it's and in fact I it ha after after decades of practicing this I'm still sometimes falling into very subtle traps. This for someone who practices a lot is an obvious one, yeah. But there are some that are actually extremely subtle, and we will learn about them as well uh, in, in this course. But but this one is pretty obvious. The the reason why you chose three hundred eighty is simply because you already know that at some point the market goes to that value. But let's say we're at, I don't know, at the moment, we're maybe at 380 or something. How, how do you know it's going to go to 200 or to 600? You don't. You really, you know, you can have a guess. but And then you go and choose some other arbitrary value. But actually going forward into the future, you have to make that choice again. But you have no idea what it is. But you did know before. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we basically need to find a different way of entering positions, right? Mm -hmm. It's a way that isn't um, depending on our knowledge of the market, our prior knowledge of the market, right? Because when we do a backtest, we always have to assume at any point that we make a trading decision, we don't know what's coming. 